Rochester, New York, a medium-sized city on the shores of Lake Ontario, founded in 1788. We are famously known as the birthplace of Kodak, Xerox, and the resting place of Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony. But today, we are known as one of the most segregated cities in America with some of the highest rates of poverty and violence, specifically for families of color. What happened to our city? Why are certain families able to thrive in our city while others are relegated to working hard with little to no return? Like most of America, Rochester's landscape began to change in the 1930s. First, the Great Migration had many families of color moving up north from the south looking for better opportunities and jobs. At the same time, our country was going through the Great Depression, with many families struggling financially to make ends meet. This is when the United States government stepped in and changed the trajectory of life for both black and white families for generations to come. When you look at so many challenges and across the nation, it, it, so much of it goes back to the history of racism. And I'm, I'm convinced that racism is a public health crisis. As many Americans struggled financially, the U.S. government looked for a way to help support families through passing laws. In the 1930s, as part of the New Deal, former New York State Governor Franklin Roosevelt, then president, signs into law one of the most racist policies in our country's history that generated wealth for over 35 million white Americans at the expense of people of color across our country. The New Deal, FDR's plan that laid the groundwork for massive inequity between racial groups to this day. Part of this plan created an agency known as the Federal Housing Administration. The FHA was an agency that was giving tax money out to Americans who wanted to buy a home. The only issue? The FHA would only give these mortgages out to white, middle, and low-class families in order to buy homes. Black families who applied for these same loans were denied and therefore could not buy homes for themselves. It was an intentional effort to really caveat and place uh, people in poverty and pocket them into certain areas, keep them out of suburban areas and uh, access to home ownership, most importantly. At its core, the FHA gave over $119 billion in governmental tax dollars to Americans from 1934 to 1968. But they were very intentional about setting up rules about which Americans got these home loans, how the loans were given out, and where people could use the loan money to buy a house. Essentially, these monies can only go to white families. In addition, the FHA set up racially homogenous neighborhoods to keep black and white families separate in our city. To ensure that white families were able to benefit from buying a home in a neighborhood that wouldn't have families of color living in it, the U.S. government began a process of redlining in Rochester. We're standing in the historic Clarissa Street neighborhood. This was the Black Broadway of Rochester, but it was also the Black neighborhood of Rochester. And not just because people of color wanted to live here, they were forced to live here. Redlining was a policy that made this a red or hazardous neighborhood. And in the 1930s, real estate agents were hired by the federal government to go house to house on every street in the city of Rochester, including here. They found that 75% of the people that lived in this neighborhood were people of color. Uh, they used a different uh, kind of not as nice term to describe this neighborhood. They just said that people of color had moved into the neighborhood and it was now one of the poorest sections of the city. Redlining is when the U.S. government looked at maps of major U.S. cities and drew red lines around the areas that they labeled as bad. What made these areas bad according to the government? They were areas that were, according to the government, full of black and foreign families. Likewise, other areas of a city were coded on the map as blue, yellow, and green. A green zone on a map meant that it was the best area to live. What made it the best? It was full of white, relatively wealthy people. A blue zone was a still desirable area to live in. This meant that the people who lived in the blue zone were white, but maybe didn't have a lot of money. Next was the yellow zone. 
which meant that the people who lived there were poorer and could be close to neighborhoods where foreign and Negroes lived. And finally, the worst designation on a map was the red zones, where family of color were forced to live, even if they had the money and means to move into other areas of the city. In addition to redlining neighborhoods, the government ensured that neighborhoods stay separate by allowing home builders to use restrictive covenants on the deeds of houses they built, explicitly stating that the home could not be owned by black families. Banks were also allowed to discriminate against non-white families by continuing to deny them home loans because of their race. The U.S. government felt that if different racial groups mixed, the value of a neighborhood would go down. For this reason, they wanted to make sure that all neighborhoods didn't have a mix of racial groups creating massively segregated cities across the country that we see here in Rochester today. While the policies of redlining were stopped in 1964 with the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Fair Housing Act, the damage had already been done. We are still dealing with the long-term impacts of redlining. Today, Monroe County is one of the most segregated counties in all of the United States. Next to flourishing suburbs with many white families, we have high levels of concentrated poverty, a school district that is perpetually cited for low performance, and high rates of crime in the city of Rochester that is predominantly made up of families of color. I think when you look at some of the more challenging areas, uh, such as the, um, the increase in, in the crime rate um, as it relates to uh, murder, uh, different activities that's going on throughout our community. I think it stems from redlining. When you had redlining going to effect throughout this country, in particular in Rochester, um, it pushed back against the opportunity to build generational wealth. A home is a form of passing on and building generational wealth. And when you um, put policies and racist policies in place to prevent people from actually owning homes and basically intentionally creating ghettos of sort. I think that creates um, a certain environment as it relates to concentrated poverty, um, which uh, brings about other challenges. These red line neighborhoods were also denied investment by the government over the years, leading to more inequity. So when you redline, you don't invest in neighborhoods. And you know what happens is just like your body or your car. If you don't invest in your car or your body over a long period of time, things start to break down. And that's what happened in our neighborhood. This inequity has also led to higher risk of health outcomes and increased mortality rates for families of color today. In the neighborhood we're at right now on Clarissa Street, Common Ground Health found uh, in 2020 that a child who's born in this red line neighborhood today is expected to live nine years less than a white child who's born in Pittsburgh. That is not by accident, it's by design because of redlining and it's something that we're allowing to continue. So when you look at something specifically like the city of Rochester, um, Rochester is one of the highest in poverty in, in childhood poverty. We are one of the highest in poverty just as a city. Right? And so when you, when you take a look at that and take a look at the city of Rochester, right, there's a lack of home ownership here. Home ownership directly correlates with some of the funding that goes into schools. Property taxes that are paid by homeowners actually go into the school district. So if we have a, a community of folks that, are not, uh, that don't own homes, and that's not everyone, but that is some people, if there's no home ownership, those taxes are not feeding into our school district, which again affects our ability to have access to resources. While it is important to examine the history of the past, it is imperative that we look forward and find a path to right the wrongs of our mistakes. Now what you will hear people say is that wasn't me. It happened 50 years ago or it happened 100 years ago. That doesn't matter because we're still feeling the effects of it. So. If you had the ability to be able to pass your house down from generation to generation, that, will allow, that would have allowed you to be able to accumulate wealth and build generational wealth. As white families of Rochester have been given the opportunity to flourish, others have been kept out of the American dream. When you think about certain impacts that government decisions have had on different classes of people and different groups of people, it has made it very, very challenging for those people to over overcome um, what has happened to them historically and be able to change the trajectory of their lives. The American dream, the idea that all people in America are able to achieve at the highest level for their life through their hard work and ideas. 
Many think of the American dream as owning a home in a safe neighborhood where you and your family can play, work, and enjoy. Where kids can go to school, work hard, and eventually achieve their own dreams. In the ideal American dream, there are no barriers to you achieving your goals, just your own hard work and dedication. That all Americans are entitled to opportunity, success, and upward social mobility. But what happens when the American dream is only a reality for certain racial groups in America? So my family got the American dream, right? Because I'm white, not because of anything I did, not because of hard work. I mean, my family worked hard, but we got the American dream because the government helped us get the American dream. My parents, my grandparents, they got to go to college because of how they looked. They got to own a home. They got to live in a safe neighborhood because of how they looked. And the government gave them money to do that. That's the government's role at any given point is to ensure that all of its citizens and residents have equal rights, have equal opportunities, at least in some sense. And right now that's, that's just clearly, clearly not the case. So, and then throw in the fact that there's uh, centuries, centuries, centuries of, of discrimination that has led to these disparities. And the government's got a huge uh, responsibility to, to uh, address those things whether through a reparations program, and there's a hundred different ways that that could look, whether through targeted support um, in different areas, in, in housing and education and healthcare, anything. Um, you know, there's, there's no end of ways that you can do it, but uh, the one thing that the government can't do is say, well, it's too bad that these disparities exist, but it's not our fault and what are we gonna do about it? And you know, those people should just go work harder. Those people should get a job that kind of thing. That's the, the path that we have taken to this point, and we need to choose a new path uh, if we're gonna have a more equitable future at some point. I think that what's missing most of all is the acknowledgement that there was a wrong that was done. And you can't fix something if you won't acknowledge that something is wrong. And what was done was wrong. For me, I, I think the American dream would consist of um, an America free of racism and discrimination with individuals having a right to grow. You know, one of the things I, I wish that everyone would understand, especially as it relates to racist policies, as long as you're concentrating and focused on oppressing one group of people, you will never grow to your full potential.